I'm very impressed by this arrangement. Tonight I'm going to talk to you about involuntary autobiographical memories. And let me start by saying that autobiographical memories are memories about events in our personal past. Uh, I'm particularly interested in such memories when they come to mind unbidden. That is, when we did not, when we get them without expecting to have them. And that's why I have put uh, Marcel Proust, the French author Marcel Proust, on the front uh, uh, slide here, because he describes such memories in his famous autobiographical uh, novel, Remembrance of Things Past. <clears throat> but I will start by providing you with a more everyday example of an involuntary autobiographical memory. This person uh, first describes the situation she is in when a memory comes to mind. She explains, I was running in the botanical garden while thinking of something I had just read for my psychology class. It was a beautiful spring day with birdsong and not many people out. I ran per routine and suddenly got a side stitch, which is unusual for me. And then a memory uh, pops up. I then remembered a day on a trip where I, was found, where I was running with my friend from England. I got a severe side stitch and he had, through his years in the military, learned some breathing techniques against side stitches, which he then taught me. So I'm sure you can see that there are some similarities between the situation she is in, when the memory comes to her mind, and the content of the memory. The most uh, salient simil uh, similarity is the side stitch but also the fact that she's running in both situations. So it's a lot of similarities that seem to have facilitated uh, this sudden occurrence of the memory. And that's something I will talk more about today. <coughs> Operationally, we define involuntary memories simply as a memory of a past event that comes to mind with no attempts of retrieval, uh, no, at least no preceding, uh, immediately preceding attempts. Subjectively, uh, the memory unexpectedly pops up in our minds. And the contrast conceptually to this phenomenon are voluntary autobiographical memories, that is, memories, again, of personal uh, events that we retrieve in a controlled and goal-directed fashion, such as when we start speculating about what did I do last Saturday, or when did somebody introduce this person to me, and we try to search for a memory. That's voluntary memories. So we have two different ways we can access our autobiographical memory base, all the experiences we have stored from our personal life. One is this involuntary uh, access route, which I, uh, is, is my main interest, where it happens unintentionally, automatically. And the other uh, uh, is this uh, voluntary uh, uh, strategy where we search uh, voluntarily and try to arrive at a memory. Now, you may be surprised to hear this, but in psychology, where, which is my field, and on other fields as well, the focus in research has been on that side of the, uh, of the slide, so to speak. Voluntary, most studies on memories for past events and memory in general have focused on memories that are strategically recalled, whereas involuntary memories, involuntary but conscious memories, were long uh, ignored in psychology. And uh, I can back that up by a few quotes from some famous psychologist. Some of you may know Endel Tolvin, who introduced the notion of episodic memory, at least some of you who have studied psychology. Very famous uh, Canadian psychology professor, who in this great book, it is, uh, says, uh, access to or actualization of, inform uh, of information in the episodic system, which is autobiographical memory, tends to be deliberate and usually requires conscious effort. F and then he says another place, few things that we perceive make us think of previous happenings in our own lives. Many stimuli that uh, could potentially serve as reminders or cues, even if they are prominently displayed to the person, will not have such effect. So, in this view, he uh, says that involuntary memories are very rare. Now, that was many years ago. More recently, uh, Davashi and Dobbins write, he, they acknowledge that occasionally a memory will just pop into uh, one's head wholly uninvited. Although we have all uh, had such involuntary recollections, 
they are arguably not the norm. Well, for, as a consequence of that view, where uh, involuntary memories were sort of defined out, uh, excluded from, from research, one might say, they were involuntary, uh, episodic is the same word as autobiographical, don't worry about it, it's about past events. Involuntary episodic remembering were for a long time limited to clinical settings and clinical theories. In other words, they were viewed as, uh, as a symptom of distress, as uh, a sign that something had gone wrong. That if a person had involuntary memories, there were some psychopathological symptoms or at least some traumatic events. Now, 20 years ago, God bless me, I started studying uh, this phenomenon. This is a paper from my PhD project, which actually came out in 1996, when Bill Clinton was the president in the US. Uh, and, uh, and where I, I, I conducted a study of involuntary memories, uh, autobiographical memories in daily life, and found that they were in fact very common. Now, uh, Therefore, many, now 20 years later, I have studied this in many, from many different perspectives, from many different uh, methods, and I uh, want to introduce the alternative view to this view that they are a symptom of distress and that they are rare. My view is that involuntary autobiographical memories are really a basic mode of remembering, and we probably could not survive without it. And well, what do I mean by a basic mode? Well, I mean that they are universal, in the sense that if you have an intact autobiographical, or if you like, episodic memory system, if you are able to remember past events, then you will also experience having these involuntary, spontaneously arising memories. They are frequent in daily life. I'll show you some evidence for that in a little bit. They operate on the same underlying Involu uh, sorry, episodic memory system as do uh, voluntary memories, the controlled memories. They access the same pool of memories. I think they are, the involuntary memories are evolutionarily earlier because they involve less of what we call executive control or executive functions. That's higher order cognitive processes located in the front uh, of uh, our brain's prefrontal cortex. Um, we also have some evidence for that with, uh, with great apes. And they are functional. They, they serve important functions in daily life, but they can become dysfunctional. The clinicians, uh, clinical psychologists and psychiatrists were right that they can sometimes be a symptom of distress, but that's not the norm. So uh, what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my to uh, talk is sort of back up that view uh, first, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, what we have figured out about characteristics of these memories. How frequent are they? And what kind of contents come to mind? Are they negative? Are they positive? And do they differ from memories we retrieve voluntarily? Then I'm going to address maybe the most intriguing phenomenon. How on earth do they come to mind? What happens? Why don't we get them all the time? Um, and then I'm going to elaborate on, uh, on uh, a view I have introduced, which is that they provide some sort of shortcut to the personal past. They are easier to access than uh, voluntary memories, and that may be helpful for people who have difficulties with uh, these executive control processes. So that's the outline. Okay, so let's look at the frequency. First, so in spite of the fact that uh, a lot of researchers had claimed that these memories are really rare and uh, voluntary uh, event memories are really the norm, nobody had actually bothered to look. And then um, until uh, a postdoc of, uh, in my center, Anne Rasmussen, got the idea to actually study this and came up with a method he could uh, use. In this study, we had uh, total of 48 participants. They were divided into two groups with 24 in each. And uh, one group had the job, got the, ta uh, the task to record their involuntary autobiographical memories during a normal day. And they were, of course, carefully instructed about what we meant by this uh, notion. And uh, the other group 
were uh, instructed to record their voluntary autobiographical memories, that is, memories they really tried to remember, uh, again during a normal day. And all the participants were equipped with a little mechanical counter, a little thing they could have in their pocket where they pressed the bottom each time they noticed an involuntary or a voluntary memory, depending on which group they were assigned to. And then we counted uh, by the end of the day. And what we found was uh, quite surprising to even us. Uh, we found that the involuntary memories, the bright bar here, were substantially more frequent than the voluntary memories. Now remember that these are event memories for events in our past. It's not all kinds of memories we're talking about here. And what this uh, shows is that when we remember events in our past, personal experiences we have had, that happens apparently more frequently in terms of these involuntary recollections uh, than, when, than trying to actively remember a past event. I'm not claiming it's the same for telephone numbers or facts, uh, but for personal events, involuntary memories, actually, an involuntary recall seems to be the most common way of accessing the past. Uh, we have done other studies also where uh, one can see that if we vary the way we were doing the recording, then we can vary these uh, frequency estimates, but still, uh, the, the basic conclusion is that involuntary memories are at least as frequent as these voluntary memories. So they are as common in daily life as uh, the voluntary memories, and probably even more common. Okay, what about content? Are they uh, more negative or more positive than, uh, than the voluntary memories? Well, in order to uh, figure that kind of, that's kind of questions out, this was actually the first study I conducted, uh, that was, um, uh, th then we used, uh, we used to do that, we used what we call a structured diary method. That's a method one can use if one wants to study everyday life phenomena as they show up in, in, really, in, in real life context. So uh, in this case, the structured diary method uh, consists of three, of two parts for the involuntary memories. Because uh, it, it is clear that these memories have to be recorded immediately when they come to mind, otherwise they are rapidly forgotten. Uh, people carry a small notebook or a, a, an electronic, uh, it could also be a cell phone or some, some sort of recording device, which they, uh, in which they answer a, a fixed set of questions every time they have an involuntary memory. And I usually limit, limit people to two per day when we're interested in looking at characteristics and content. In order, to stop, uh, in order to avoid people to, uh, from generating memories. So immediately when they have a memory, they take up their notebook or their phone or whatever we use and answer these fixed set of uh, questions and it only takes two minutes. It's something they, can, something they can easily do while they are uh, in the bus or attending a lecture or whatever they're doing. Then later the same day when they have more time, they answer a more extensive questionnaire based on the notes they have made in the notebook. And then, in order to have a comparison, uh, they remove a sticker and, get, uh, and see a word, and then they are asked to retrieve voluntarily a memory in association with that, with that word, so that we can compare these involuntary memories with memories retrieved voluntarily. And of course, they answer the same kind of questions for both types of memories. Now, I won't track you through all these uh, diary studies we have conducted, but we uh, just uh, sum up the main findings. There's been a, we have seen a lot of similarities between these two types of memories. Both types of memories show a dominance of positive <coughs> events. People remember many more positive events in their lives, if they are not depressed, than negative events. We also, they also show the same forgetting rate. Uh, we tend to retrieve, uh, remember things that has happened recently uh, much more frequently than things that we have experienced uh, several years ago. And the curve sort of is similar for both types of memories. There's also a dominance of visual imagery uh, for both types of memories. So they're not that different. Let me just back up this claim that they are, uh, that they are predominantly positive. Here you can see in two studies, these refer to two different studies. 
Uh, but you can see that the pattern is very similar. These are the, the red ones are the involuntary, the blue ones are the voluntary. And you can see that there's a dominance of positive uh, memories for both types of memories, no matter whether you retrieve them involuntarily or voluntarily. And that is important in relation to these claims that were earlier on that involuntary memories are really a sign of distress. No, they are not. They're just as positive as voluntary memories. Now, aren't there any differences between uh, these two types of memories? Because if there weren't, it wouldn't be so interesting. Well, but there are differences. Involuntary memories are the kind of memories that are more likely to make you laugh or cry or give you butterflies in your stomach. Involuntary memories have more mood impact when they come to mind and more physical reaction. Uh, some uh, clinical psychologists call that flashback quality. It's like we're being transported more back in time when we have involuntary memories compared to voluntary autobiographical memories. And the involuntary memories also more frequently re refer to very specific events. That is, uh, memories about a specific moment in the past, a very specific situation in the past that we can say happened at a particular time and place. So not just any memory of my grandmother, but a particular situation with my grandmother. So let me give you uh, just a little examples of this uh, um, finding of more mood impact and physical reaction, more flashback quality uh, for involuntary memories. Um, here's an example of a negative memory that comes with such flashback uh, quality. Uh, the, the participant, when she gets the memory, uh, is a passenger in a car, and she's sitting in the car thinking the driver, which is her boyfriend, goes much too fast, and then the memory pops up. She remembers, once a young guy crashed into the back of my car on the very same highway. And she thinks this is a highly vivid, vivid uh, memory, and she says, uh, she claims, uh, she, she raised that it has a neg negative mood impact, and it makes her shiver. Make, make me shiver. Um, the same can happen if it's a positive memory. Here's an example of a, like a positive flashback. A young man uh, who is uh, talking about the coming summer vacation when the memory pops up. Then he says, I remember myself in the water on a surfboard in Australia right in that moment when the wave, when the wave, wave catches the board. Right in that moment when the wave catches the board. It's a highly uh, vivid memory. It gives him a positive mood impact, and uh, he has a physical reaction. My chest raised, and I got butterflies in my stomach. <coughs> uh, involuntary memories more frequently have this kind of reaction. Um, uh, when we look through uh, a number of studies we've conducted, I don't think this is the complete list, you can see that uh, compared to voluntary memories across these studies, involuntary memories have more of this mood impact. And I think the next slide is about physical reaction, where we can see also that uh, when, the, uh, when there is a difference between involuntary and voluntary memories, it is the involuntary memories that have more uh, uh, physical reaction. And I think we have conducted some more recent studies showing the same pattern. Now, what about this? this I just mentioned that involuntary memories are more specific. Well, a specific event, uh, here's an example. A specific event could be uh, one particular time in North Carolina, this is actually my own memory, when I found a piece of metal in my soup in a Thai restaurant when we were having lunch there. That's a very specific memory. It refers to a particular uh, situation. And in contrast to that, a non-specific memory, a general event we call it, is what, what normally happens when I eat in a Thai restaurant <coughs> with, my, with my friend. Uh, such, remembering such specific events are actually um, something that develops quite late in, uh, in, in, uh, in childhood. It's, it's something that requires quite a lot. Therefore, it's intriguing that uh, when we compare involuntary memories to voluntary memories, they are typically found to, be, uh, to have a higher frequency of, self, of such specific memories. You can see across these studies, with a few exceptions, involuntary memories are more specific than voluntary memories. So, that leads us to uh, the next question I want to address. How uh, do they come to mind? Um, well, again, we know from diary studies, these naturalistic studies, 
that, and also as uh, in the example I showed you in the beginning, that involuntary memories are cued, which means that they are facilitated uh, by some feature overlap between the current situation and the past <laughs> event, such as the side stitch example I gave you in the beginning. In the great majority of uh, cases, people are capable of identifying such overlapping features. And it's also, we have also found that these triggers are most frequently features of the external environment, such as people or places, objects, sensory experiences, and so forth, so forth rather than uh, internal thoughts and emotions. So this uh, retrieval process is, is very much driven by, our, by random things in, in our environment. Okay, but that leaves us with a critical question. If such cues as triggers in the environment are all that matters, why aren't we constantly flooded by involuntary autobiographical memories? Every moment is filled with potential cues. The shoes you're wearing, people sitting next to you, your hands and so forth, all of this was, were parts in a part of previous uh, situations. Why do these memories not constantly come to you? And we have to say, well, that must be because some cues are better than other cues, and some cues just don't work at all. But how can we decide, how can we figure out why some cues are better than other cues? Disentangling this issue required more controlled experiments than these diary studies. So we had to move so to speak, from the field, take what we have learned from the field uh, studies and move uh, to the lab in order to figure out these things. Now, one notion or one conception that uh, helped us uh, uh, build an experiment to, to uh, examine this is the notion of cue item discriminability, which simply refers to how easily a given cue isolates an item. Let me try to unpack that. If you, have only, if you have seen such a, a weird uh, instrument or heard such a weird instrument, a rare instrument, once uh, in, in uh, your past, hearing it again is a strong cue for that past situation. Whereas an instrument you can associate with many past experiences, such as such a ha uh, harmonica, is a weak cue because it is associated with too many things to activate any of them. They become a mess, they become a blur, there's a lot of interference going on, uh, and, and the cue is, is simply not, uh, suffers from overload, it's overloaded with associations, and therefore is inefficient in relation to any of these events, especially if there's a lot more than three. So that's why you don't constantly get involuntary memories in response to your shoes, because they're associated with too many situations in the past. That's, that's the theoretical starting point we had. Now, uh, in order to see if that was right, we conducted an experiment. We dreamed up a, 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 a paradigm where we used uh, sounds, we used sounds as cues and scenes as something people should remember. So in uh, our first phase, which is the learning phase, uh, we presented scenes together with sounds. So people were sitting in front of a computer and they heard uh, sounds and saw a picture of a scene, for example, a scene with uh, trees. And uh, then in phase two, we used these sounds as cues for involuntary and voluntary uh, retrieval. We did not... Uh, um, yeah, no, let me just do this. So this is a little bit complicated, but hang on. So we had unique sounds, which were sounds that people heard only once. Only once did they hear a dog bark during this... Uh, during this encoding or uh, learning session. And then we had repeated sounds, which were sounds they heard many times, such as very similar snippets of bird song. To make things even more complicated, we had also scenes they only saw once, such as just one picture of a dog, versus scenes they saw very similar types of scenes many times, such as very similar pictures of uh, uh, scenes with, with trees. And then we combine these uh, uh, two dimensions in this experiment. Now, then in the, uh, in, re in the retrieval phase, 
in the involuntary condition. We did not tell people they, they, they participated in a memory, memory experiment. We said, now we want you to conduct a sound location task. It's a very boring task, but still attention, attention demanding. The sounds derived from the encoding from the learning phase, mixed with some novel sounds. We said you should really tell us which side of your head you hear the sound, but uh, if during this process a scene comes to your mind, please indicate that by a button press. Uh, during the, uh, for the voluntary recall, we simply presented these sounds and, and told people that they had to retrieve memories in response to the sounds. Now, uh, back to this complicated picture again. We predicted that unique sounds would be more uh, better cues than repeated sounds. So, and, you, and, and so that the best condition, the one that would give us most memories, was with a condition where we had unique sounds paired with unique scenes, because there would be minimal interference. Whereas the two conditions with repeated sounds would be very inefficient for eliciting memories. And the, con the last condition here, where we had unique sounds but repeated scenes, would be sort of in the middle. And that was pretty much what we found. Here's the condition with unique cues and unique uh, scenes, uh, the condition with no cue overload, uh, and that was the one that gave us most involuntary memories, uh, followed by the second one where we had unique cues but repeated scenes. Um, but the two conditions with repeated cues yielded very uh, little memories at all. So, what about the voluntary retrieval? Well, uh, when we plotted the voluntary, this, is the volu this was the involuntary, this is the voluntary on top. Uh, you can see it follows pretty much the same pattern. People get more memories when they have to remember because, of course, they can remember when they get a sound and are told to. Uh, and uh, this one differs a bit. Uh, it seems that uh, people actually voluntarily remember quite a lot to these repeated cues and repeated scenes. But I, I don't want to go into that. Uh, it's not important in this particular context. What is important is that these findings were very robust, they replicated across experiments, and uh, what we can take home from it is that we found that involuntary recall very systematically as a function of, the, of, of uh, cue item discriminability. So what matters is the distinctiveness of the cue, at least that matters a lot, and also the distinctiveness of the scenes of the events to be remembered. Now, what is uh, the functionality of this? Well, one important function is that it prevents us from being flooded by involuntary autobiographical memories every moment because often the current situation will not provide sufficiently distinctive cues. And it also increases the probability of relevance of the memory to the current situation because past events which have a distinct feature overlap to the current situation are more likely to provide relevant information uh, compared to memories without such overlap. If there is a distinct overlap, then maybe it's relevant. Uh, there's no guarantee it is, but it optimizes the probability that it has some relevance to the, carries some important information to the uh, current situation. So, um, let me now uh, talk a little bit about retrieval effort and introduce the view that involuntary memories uh, provide a very direct access, a shortcut to the personal past. Uh, when we are told to retrieve something voluntarily, we start with, a ver it can be a verbal request or thought, uh, what did you do last time there was a US election? Then we generate a search description based on our general knowledge about how we maybe generally, uh, what we do generally on election evenings, uh, and try to figure a memory based on that search description. That's what we do when we strategically recall a memory. What is interesting with involuntary memories is that here we have a situational feature of some kind, a, a, a trigger of some kind. We have no uh, elaboration of that cue, there's no self-generated search description, the memory is simply discriminated by this situational uh, feature. So we bypass this process where we are elaborating ourselves. Is there any evidence for that? Yes, there, there is evidence for uh, the fact that involuntary memories are faster, that they're easier. 
So retrieval time is usually an index for the amount of processing that goes on in our mind. And across many experiments, we have found that using this paradigm I just described to you, that involuntary memories come to mind more quickly than voluntary memories. Uh, and that supports the view that they are easier, that they provide a shortcut. We also have some evidence from uh, brain imaging research. Uh, I won't uh, tell you about the details of these experiments, but uh, we were able to, uh, using this picture sound experiment, to contrast voluntary and involuntary retrieval. And we found that only voluntary strategic retrieval uh, were associated with uh, increased acti activity in an, a part of the prefrontal cortex, which we know is typically associated with controlled episodic or autobiographical uh, memory retrieval. The involuntary condition did not show any activity in that area. Whereas our, a measure we have for an index for having a memory, actually accessing a memory, showed the same uh, areas activated in, for both types of memories. So both voluntary and involuntary memories shared overlaps in regions known to be associated with successful recollection. Uh, so, uh, but only voluntary retrieval showed this increased activity in the prefrontal cortex. So, uh, in summary, um, involuntary retrieval is something that is associative and highly context dependent, involves little effort, and as a consequence of that, it's easy to get, but it's non-selective. You don't decide yourself what you remember. That's the downside. The uh, upside is it's, it involves little effort. It operates uh, through mechanisms of association, uh, which uh, one can argue uh, optimizes uh, uh, functionality, this notion of Q overload that hinders uh, that we are flooded all the time from uh, involuntary memories. It prevents us, as I just said, from being flooded, this principle from being flooded by involuntary memories, and it also increases the probability that there's some relevance between the memory, uh, of, for the, uh, of the memory to the current situation. Um, this, uh, these processes may become dysfunctional uh, after highly emotional events due to these very same mechanisms, that we don't select the memories, that they come unbidden that they involve more mood impact and so forth. But that's uh, another uh, lecture. I won't talk about that today. Yeah, you can get it. So let me just say a little bit by the end here about why it is important uh, to have such a shortcut. And that uh, can be especially important for people or animals for that matter who have difficulties with retrieving memories in a controlled fashion. Such as uh, non-human animals, uh, young children, people with brain Im uh, injury, uh, people with depression, older people, and people who suffer from dementia. Uh, I won't go through the first three, although we have some data on it, uh, but I will give you some examples about, uh, from depression, uh, research, aging, and dementia. And um, first, uh, let me say something about depression. It is well known in the clinical literature that people with depression suffer from overgeneral memories. They have problems retrieving specific episodes. Let me give you an example of that. This is an interview between a therapist and a client. The, pair, the therapist is trying to get this client, this depressed client, to talk about a specific memory, a memory of a specific event. So he interviews. When you were young, what sort of things made you happy? The patient answers, well, things used to be all right then. I mean, better than they are now, I think. When my dad was there, he used to take me for walks on the common sometimes after lunch on a Sunday. The therapist <coughs> says, can you tell me about one such walk? Uh, the patient answers, well, we used to go out after lunch sometimes. We would take a ball and play around. Afterwards, we might go see my granny who lived on the other side of the common. He still hasn't told about one specific situation. The therapist tries again. When you think back now, can you remember, remember any particular time? I want you to try and recall any one of these times. It does not have to be particularly important or special, but just give me a damn episode. 
patient. I remember there used to be other people on the common sometimes, on other children on the common sometimes. Sometimes they would be friends of mine, and I would stop up and chat to them for a while. Can you remember any particular time when you met any of your friends? <coughs> if it was winter, there weren't usually many people about. <laughs> so he really has problems getting to a particular uh, memory. Now, uh, some uh, years ago, uh, a postdoc in my center, Lynn Watson, and some uh, US, uh, sorry, UK colleagues and, my, uh, and I conducted a study where we used this uh, involuntary autobiographical memory diary with people who were uh, stable depressed, who, were, uh, who had a very severe depression, quite severe depression, people who were in the middle, and people who had never been depressed. And as you can see, when we looked at their voluntary memories, the depressed individuals, the very depressed individuals, had uh, substantially fewer specific events when we looked at their voluntary memories, when they had to retrieve. But when we looked at their involuntary memories, this difference disappeared. Again, consistent with the fact that involuntary memories are a shortcut. It bypasses some of these things that makes it difficult to arrive at a specific event. Same. Uh, yeah, same story with aging, actually. We know from literature on aging that voluntary access to specific episodic details deteriorates with aging. Older people have difficulties remember specific episodes. Maybe not as much as this depressed individual, but still. And this is, again, assumed to be due to reduced executive processes, uh, less efficient search strategies. So therefore, we should predict that it's not so bad for involuntary than for voluntary memories. And some years ago, uh, a group of, uh, of British psychologists studied that, again through this diary method. Um, they looked at specific events for involuntary versus voluntary recall in young and old uh, participants. And when, we looked at, or when they looked at the voluntary memories, you can see the older participants had fewer specific events. But guess what? When, we looked, uh, when they looked at the involuntary memories, that difference um, disappeared. Again, consistent with the fact that involuntary memories provide some sort of shortcut to uh, the personal past. What about dementia? Well, um, we are studying that uh, in collaboration with the old town, the Gamleby in Aarhus, where uh, they have, uh, they have uh, a whole uh, apartment <coughs> built, uh, filled with cues for, all, for memories from uh, older people's uh, youth. Uh, they call it the reminiscence apartment or Erinnerungsleilighed, uh, where everything is uh, decorated and organized as if it was in the 1950s. And uh, the, what is the idea behind that? Well, there are two sources, two, two lines of research that, that uh, explains that. One is uh, this involuntary, spontaneously arising autobiographical memories I have talked about, and the other is what we know about the lifespan distribution of autobiographical memories in middle-aged and older individuals. So let me say a little bit about that. It is uh, when older people, middle-aged and older people are looking back at, that, uh, at their uh, life, they tend to recall, this is the age at the time of the remembered event, uh, and uh, what we see when we, when we plot uh, this kind of data is that there is a dominance of memories from young adulthood. It's called the reminiscence bump. That bump, that reminiscence bump, is also found in people with dementia. These are real data. Uh, what I showed you before was just an illustration. Uh, so all the people with dementia also have uh, best preserved memories from, uh, when the, from the earlier parts of their life. This is another uh, slide showing the same. Uh, the see, the dementia also show this uh, dominance of memories from earlier parts of their life. So how, at the same time, they have difficulties retrieving memories. They have difficulties strategically retrieving memories. Um, so how should we try to activate uh, memories with, uh, in people with dementia? Well. Uh, we should, of course, provide highly discriminative cues. We know that from our experiments. And these cues should, of course, match the time. They should speak to the time uh, period from which 
these uh, individ individuals' memories are best preserved. So it doesn't help much to give them cues to something that happened yesterday when the me if the memories they have best preserved are something that happened 30 or 40 years ago. So the ideal, uh, if we want to activate memories in, in people with uh, dementia, would be, following these ideas, a total immersion into a holistic and historically authentic environment which reconstructs the cultural and material context of these uh, people's youth and therefore allow memories to be cued along a lot of different modalities, a lot of different sensory modalities, uh, and, and so forth. And that's exactly what this uh, reminiscence uh, apartment is about. And so, in one study we conducted some years ago, we have some ongoing research also, but I'll just present you with some uh, the published data, is um, we found that uh, when, the old, when the people with dementia were in the old town setting, compared to an everyday uh, nursing uh, home setting where they, where, where they did the same things as in the old time setting, they had uh, more uh, autobiographical remembering, uh, they had more detail, they told more details memories, and uh, they also had more self-initiated, uh, spontaneous recollections in the old town uh, environment. So, I think I am approaching the end of my talk now. Um, so let me try to sum this up. Uh, involuntary autobiographical memories are frequent in daily life. We know that they operate on the same episodic memory system, or underlying memory system, as uh, voluntary memories do, but involuntary memories involve less effort. They occur automatically in situations where there is a distinct feature overlap with uh, a content of a past event, but it should be uh, a distinct uh, overlap. Uh, that's the least when it's most likely to happen. And then I have argued that they provide a shortcut a cognitive shortcut to the personal past, and that may hold specific advantages for individuals uh, with reduced executive functions, uh, such as uh, individuals with dementia, people with depression, and also uh, may be um, a help for uh, older, healthy individuals. And with this, I will actually end by quoting Marcel Proust. I showed you in the beginning the picture. Uh, he says in his book, that it doesn't help to search voluntarily for memories. He says, and so it is with our past. It is labor in vain to attempt to recapture it. All the efforts of our intellect must prove futile. The past is hidden somewhere outside the realm, beyond the reach of the intellect, in some material object, in that sensation that material object will give us which we do not expect. Thank you very much. <laughs>